Vikas, are we going with the video or without that? One of structural engineers, also known as IA Struct E, was conceptualized and constituted in the year 2002 by a group of senior professional structural engineers from all over the country. IS Structi is registered under the Society's Registration Act 21 of 1860. IS Structi is a national apex body of structural engineers in India with a mission to promote structural engineering profession and cater to the professional needs of the structural fraternity. In the short span of two decades, association has attained an eminent position in the professional field. Its membership is valued very highly in the profession. Since since inception, IAS Structi has been led by eminent structural engineers like late Sri Mahindra Raj, late Sri Kumar Ghosh, Sri Subhash Chand Mehrotra, Professor Mahesh Tandran, Sri Alok Bhomik, Sri Manoj Mittal, and Professor R. Pradeep Kumar as its president. IA Structi is a permanent member of Engineering Council of India and interacts with the government on professional and policy matters related to civil and structural engineers. To expand its reach, IA Structi has collaboration with various international professional like-minded associations and institutions. IA Structi's prime objective is supporting and protecting the profession of structural engineering by upholding professional standards and acting as a mouthpiece for structural engineers in India. IA Structi endeavor to ensure that its members develop the necessary skill in structural engineering and work to the highest standards by maintaining a commitment to professional ethics and standards. IA Struct is actively engaged in organizing several continuing professional development CPD courses for structural engineers to help them update their knowledge and advance their career paths. It also conducts refresher courses for young and practicing engineers and student-oriented programs, seminars, workshops, conferences, technical lectures and discussions related to the latest technological advancements and case studies are also organized regularly for members to enable them to continuously update their knowledge and skill set by interacting with the best minds from the industry. IS Structi's activities are widely appreciated and known for quality quality technical contents. IA Structi is also actively engaged in publishing its quarterly journal Structural Engineering Digest SED, code commentaries, professional guidelines and a monthly newsletter. IA Structi's publications are becoming popular with time. IA Structi has representation in various technical committees of BIS and IRC as well. Its members are actively contributing to National Code of Formulations in the year 2020, IA Structi started national awards competition to stimulate interest in the structural engineering field and to promote innovative thinking and creativity. The awards are presented to the winners in recognition of their outstanding contribution to structural engineering in the categories which include Outstanding Structure, Outstanding Structural Engineer, Outstanding Woman Structural Engineer, Promising Young Structural Engineer, and Best Master's Thesis in Structural Engineering. IA Struct E is currently operating from four regional centers, namely Eastern, Western, Northern and Southern, having its headquarters in Delhi to inculcate the professional culture and provide handholding to the budding engineers. IA Struct E has its student chapters in several leading engineering institutions as well. Membership of IA Struct E is open to all 
all civil and structural engineers engaged in structural engineering profession. Members are elected based on their qualifications and experience in different grades as per eligibility requirements prescribed in the bylaws. Each application is carefully scrutinized before electing the members. More information about IA Struct E is available on its website www.iastructe.co.in. Good morning. Welcome to uh, the lecture the panel discussion on safe demolition of super tech twin towers in noida and this demolition happened on 28th of august 2022 almost one year back and at around 2 30 pm it was done on the orders of supreme court honorable supreme court and it was the most widely covered media covered uh, event I think all media channels covered this, uh, this, 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 this kind of engineering uh, event, and uh, they covered from the field. They covered from the newsrooms also. Rather, they invited me also. Uh, in spite of my declining, I was forced to rather uh, uh, to, to to join two panel discussions on two TV channels. Even I was not having any knowledge of this kind of a thing. Still. There was so, so much of uh, uh, hype on this. So uh, I think it is very important for uh, all the structure engineers and civil engineers to understand what were the complexities, how it was done, and uh, so that everybody can learn from all these things. And today we have very uh, eminent uh, people who will be speak, is speaking on it. And this event will be in two sessions. For part one, there will be lectures. In the second session, there will be panel discussion. So those people who will be making the presentation today and they, those who will be available in the panel discussion, these are the people who were actually involved in the planning, designing and executing uh, this uh, demolition. This was very, it was done very precisely. So uh, uh, we have our uh, president, uh, Dr. Prajeev Kumar today with us. I will request Dr. Prajeev Kumar uh, to, to say the opening remarks. And let me just introduce Dr. Pradeep Kumar, although he's a very well-known structural engineer uh, with more than 20 years of experience in teaching, uh, research, and administration. And at present, he's the president of IA Structure, and he's also holding the position of director uh, CBRI, Rurki. Uh, Dr. Pradeep Kumar, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Manojji. So uh, first of all, I uh, warmly welcome all the participants to this uh, uh, lecture come panel discussion session which is organized by Indian Association of Structural Engineers and jointly by uh, CSIR Central Building Research Institute. So I'm going to talk about uh, three points. One is uh, about uh, IA study and second about uh, CBRI and the third one about this uh, event itself. Now, as you have seen from the promo video that uh, Indian Association of Structural Engineers is a profession society, professional society works for the needs of structural engineers. So the organization uh, brings to structural engineering fraternity various activities uh, to enhance the knowledge and skills of structural engineers, structural engineers so that uh, they uh, take up the challenges which are thrown by uh, society as well as nature in front of them. And uh, now coming to Central Building Research Institute, uh, CBRI is a research organization which works on almost all the aspects of uh, uh, building research. We have uh, uh, architecture, planning, energy efficiency, geotechnical geohazards, uh, a plethora of uh, R&D groups are available. We have state-of-the-art uh, fire uh, research facility and also uh, a group uh, uh, on uh, heritage and uh, special structures. So I'm just covering uh, briefly. You may go to these two uh, 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 organization websites to know more about uh, the details. Now, coming to the uh, today's event itself. So, as it is mentioned by our past president, Shri Manojji, that Honorable Supreme Court has passed an order uh, in August 2021 to carry out the demolition of uh, Super Tech Twin Towers Snyder Building. So, such a thing as uh, uh, is unheard in the country. 
never been attempted at the massive scale. So, Honorable Supreme Court uh, entrusted this responsibility to uh, Central Building Research Institute to carry out uh, the uh, overall supervision and uh, uh, execute uh, this one by involving various agencies which are experts in this area. So, uh, this building, as you know, it's a uh, 32, uh, sorry, 9 to 12 story in the close vicinity. Seven adjacent buildings were there and there was a uh, gas pipeline also. So, these two buildings were brought down in uh, uh, 2000, uh, uh, I think, uh, I forgot the date, but uh, 2022. So, we'll hear uh, the more technical details right from the people who are uh, involved in its uh, uh, demolition. Uh, demolition activity. So, to start with, uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. D.P. Kanungo, okay, uh, who has uh, spearhead, spearheaded this activity along uh, with the team of uh, uh, scientists from CBRI and our uh, sister laboratory that is uh, CSIR Simfer and other uh, experts from other organizations. So, I will request actually Kanungo ji to introduce uh, all of them before they speak. But uh, it's my pleasant duty to introduce Dr. Kanungo uh, to this uh, August gathering. So, Dr. D.P. Kanungo is presently a chief scientist and a group coordinator of uh, Geohazards and uh, Geotechnical and Geohazard group. He has expertise in uh, disaster risk reduction. So, he is a professor of uh, Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research. He has a very vast uh, professional experience. Uh, uh, he has been in the forefront along with the team of the scientists during uh, Yoshimut uh, crisis also. So, he is uh, known for taking uh, uh, big challenges with the able support of uh, uh, fellow scientists or uh, colleagues. Now, uh, I am handing over the mic and or uh, this uh, gathering to Dr. D.P. Kanungo. You, you may please take it forward. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. D.P. Kanungo. And uh, let me first introduce the speakers, the uh, people who are really on the ground for the safe demolition of Supertech Twin Towers in Noida. So I will first introduce uh, Dr. Manojit Samanta, who is a principal scientist in Central Building Research Institute with a geotechnical engineering expertise. So he has looked into all the geotechnical aspects in the Twin Tower demolition. And next, I will introduce uh, Dr. Devadatta Ghosh, who has expertise in structural engineering. And he was looking after all the structural aspects involved in safe demolition. And the next is Dr. Suman Kumar, again from uh, Central Building Research Institute. He is also a uh, scientist and structural engineering expert. And then Mr. Mickey Mekan Dal Behra, who is also a structural in, uh, engineer and a senior scientist in Central Building in Research Institute. And he was looking uh, after the instrumentation and monitoring aspects of, of, of uh, the Twin Tower demolition. And then we have two scientists from our sister organizations, the Dr. C. Somliana, who is a chief scientist in Central Institute of Mining and Fuel Research, and he's an expert on explosives and blast design. And similarly, Dr. Harsh Burma, he is also senior principal scientist in Central Institute of Mining and Fuel Research Institute. And he's also expert of vibration control, instrumentation monitoring, and, and blast design. And along with us, the great man, Mr. Utkars Mehta, who is, who is the executor for this safe demolition. He has taken a lot of pains from the very beginning and till the end. So uh, let me start with my presentation, with the introductory presentation, and then subsequently we will go into the uh, deeper details of, of minute details of every aspect what I talked about. Dr. Kanunji, did you miss uh, uh, Joe Brickman? Uh, yeah, I, I just missed uh, Joe, Joe Brickman, who is from Jet Demolition and uh, in collaboration with, with uh, Edifice Engineering, Mr. Uskar Smeta. He, he, he is a uh, 
pillar of of demolition he has vast experience across the globe do uttarsh mehta ji operates mostly in indian uh, demolition but jo birkman is is a global uh, uh, name and uh, uh, he has a lecture in this but uh, due to some some problem he has deputy is next person in his jet demolition um, uh, company so so we'll have a greater details from from uh, uh, those people so i think my uh, slides are visible yes, yes. yes. yeah so let us i have given an introductory and i am telling it's a tale of two towers it's it's just uh, we will go through a script like like it's a story now now a successful story so so uh, uh, it's not moving yeah now so the uh, <coughs> thing goes it like this the the uh, surrounding tires towers that is ikorba that is emerald coat uh, resident welfare association and uh, there is another um, society called ats village these people they went to the high court that is elahabad high court regarding the problem there was a issue on the building bylaws the the guidelines has been violated in the construction of super tech twin towers so they went into the elahabad court and finally they landed into the supreme court of india though they got the clearance from elahabad high court that these two towers will be demolished but but with a petition in 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 uh, uh, Sup honorable supreme court of india so again the case has been taken up in in honorable supreme court of india and in august 2021 honorable supreme court with its verdict told that it will be demolished both the towers will be demolished and they have clearly mentioned it will be demolished under overall supervision and expert guidance technical guidance from csir cbri so there comes our role to to go for a safe demolition with overall supervision and expert guidance and in between it was planned earlier in may 2021 but due to delay in execution and csir cbri wanted the perfection the scientific perfection in the whole process because we have to assure the safe demolition so so i appeared before the honorable chief, chief justice of india in the uh, supreme court of india and i narrated the whole story how serious is it and how technically or scientifically we should go about it so then uh, the honorable chief justice told yes everybody has to align with csir cbri has to cooperate with csir cbri and it will be demolished in a safe manner and then we propose that august 21 with a cushion of one week will be the demolition date and we will finish every uh, bit of aspects involved in the demolition process <laughs> then honorable supreme court told that go by 28th of august so with that verdict 28th of august has been fixed then if i will talk about building demolition there will be two way of demolition one is mechanical demolition the other one will be the demolition using explosives when we talk about explosives actually the mechanical and explosive using explosives the demolition has to be <coughs> depending on the site requirement if we have, we have enough space open space in the surroundings we can go for mechanical demolition if we have in a very congested or restricted area then we have to think of very um, using explosives how perfectly we can do 
and in explosives you can see that i have written building implosion generally we we when we use explosives we call it ex explosion why it is implosion because there's a very restricted area in the surrounding there are a lot of structures we have to safeguard those structures so <coughs> the implosion means we have to contain everything within that area not a single debris should should fly over or any sort of problem to the surrounding structure and also during during media telecast or video you must have uh, Heard about waterfall way of of implosion? Why it is waterfall way? Because in three sides it was almost restricted by different structures, and on one side there were some open area. So we have to pull both the towers and then make a fall. So it will look like a waterfall while <coughs> demolition is taking place. So. we called it as a waterfall type of implosion in building implosion the first aspect is standard operating procedure what is the task method statement or special safety guidelines and procedures and how to control the hazard and and how to mitigate the risk to the surrounding environment the next is reconnaissance and engineering survey where we we visit the site we identify what are the aspects involved then we do the hazard identification and risk assessment and finally we have to go for a disaster management plan so that we have to have a controlled demolition we have to have a safe demolition we have to check about the ground vibration so that we have to control the ground vibration we have to safeguard the surrounding structures and what are the present health of those surrounding structures then there will be a debris the demolition debris so what to do with that debris because it's a waste how to convert it into a wealth so that's a debris management plan and the management of the whole procedure so this encompasses the process of building implosion if i will talk about the twin towers so the two towers one is named as apex and the other one is named as sian and the apex is 102 meter <coughs> height and sian is 97 meter height and the the total number of floors it was 34 that is in in uh, apex it was 34 uh, story that is two basements ground floor and and 31 and cn it is it is 30 story buildings with two basements and it was a rc framed structures and there are heavy shear walls all around and the rivers it was a finest quality of of fe 500 and with heavy reinforcement it the structure has been made and the concrete characteristic strength was varying between 35 to 40 mpa and the structure was very strong there was no problem with this structure but there was a violation of building bylaws because this area used to be a green area for the surrounding towers so this is one way of violation and in uttar pradesh the building bylaws says between two towers there should be at least 16 meter gap so there was nearest tower was 9 meter gap so that sort of violation and finally to to safeguard our building bylaws and this thing because we have a different seismic zones and and we are vulnerable to many such disasters and we we look forward our people's comfort people's uh, health uh, concern and people's safety so from that point of view honorable supreme court has has instructed to demolish this structure and if you'll see the surroundings the the northeastern side where i i say the emerald court uh, resident welfare association there are very many towers so there are five towers within within the critical zone of this thing and it was the nearest one was 9 meter distance and on the eastern side there are ads village Uh, um, uh, that that was at least 21 meter uh, distance or or 20.25 on south 
साउथ वेस्टर्न थर्टी वन मीटर एंड द मेजर चैलेंज वॉज देर इज ऑपरेटिंग गेल गैस पाइपलाइन विथ थर्टी सिक्स बार प्रेशर एंड द गेल पीपुल टोल दे कैन नॉट शट डाउन द गैस पाइपलाइन under the running condition you have to do the demolition so so uh, these are the challenges the the uh, uh, in the surroundings so the guiding rules what we have followed for safe demolition is the scientific knowledge and principles we will go by scientific knowledge and principles and we will use the engineering interventions that is engineering tools and techniques and also the advanced technology for uh, safe demolition in every aspect of of demolition and also a huge experience of all the experts have gone into this process so that these are the guiding rules for safe demolition and the safe demolition means it's not only demolishing the structure safely but as but also ensuring the safety of every aspect in the surroundings whether it is environment like dust pollution whether it is flora fauna whether it is the the surrounding residential structures the uh, safety and and the integrity of the structures has to be maintained and the gale gas pipeline every aspect has to be taken care of and defining the process of safe demolition so we first visited the site along with the whole team we identify the problem we assess the problem and we assess what are the aspects to be looked into very many aspects i will come into details and we will do a hazard or vulnerability assessment of whole process and then finally risk assessment then <coughs> to mitigate the the vulnerability or risk we have to have a strategy and planning and we have to execute with perfection those are the defined uh, the process of safe demolition we we go by each and every step of this and if i will talk about the different aspects to be looked into for safe demolition the structural aspect what i told that structural integrity uh, structure um, uh, of that both twin towers and how effectively it will be demolished and the surrounding structures structural integrity or structural uh, resistance or resiliency of those structures and how to improve the structural resiliency of those structures so that the ground vibration cannot affect those structures then all the geotechnical aspects because when the debris will fall there will be a vibration how to observe how to uh, observe those vibrations in the ground not to allow to travel to a nearby structure so all those aspects then the major one is how much explosives in what pattern in what way and in which floors of the twin towers will be given the blast design and the the amount or or the type of explosives those aspects then the vibration control then i told the environmental aspects like there will be lot of dust or or so in what time the dust will settle and what should we follow for dust settlement and all those issues because there are elderly people and the health issues and all those issues so we have to address the environmental aspects also then there will be a huge i think 80000 ton of we we estimated that 80000 ton of uh, demolition debris will be generated and with the two basements in both the towers we we estimated that around 50000 uh, tons will be will be absorbed so 30000 tons of debris has to be <coughs> processed and and that should be a management plan and we have to convert it into a wealth well a, 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 a product which can be used in future constructions then safety of the surroundings there are parks there are roads and the 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 safety of the traffic everything has to be in a in a in a very planned way and for that we have to define a critical zone which will be directly exposed so so we define the critical zone within a 15 50 meter radius and we have to evacuate that so evacuation plan for that and the exclusion zone the traffic will not be allowed in a exclusion zone i will show the exclusion zone also and the evacuation plan and the 
total project management where where uh, uh, Mr. Utkarsh Mehta or Edifice Engineering played a vital role in the overall management or execution of the project. So the major role of CSIR team, why I am calling CSIR, where two sister organizations are dealt with this, this Central Building Research Institute and Mining and Fuel Research Institute. So whom to select for executing these things? So we had a lot of expression of interest from different companies, different firms. And finally, the best one, the most capable one was the edifice engineering, which is placed in Mumbai. And they have a collaboration with Jet Demolition South Africa. So, and we, we evaluated each and every experience of them. And finally, NOIDA and CBRI, uh, CSIR, together recommended that edifice in collaboration with Jet Demolition South Africa will execute this problem. Then that was the first task. And then all the team members, whoever has involved, uh, were involved, whether it is CSIR team or edifice or Jet Demolition or Gale or Supertech, um, India Private Limited, they, they have done to the perfection each and every bit of the process. So explosives, blast design, evaluation, prediction of ground vibration and air overpressure, gale gas pipeline safety analysis and remedial measures, pre and post demolition structural audit and analysis of the surroundings, then strengthening of surrounding structures, then for debris, the, the, the uh, impact cushion of debris and the use of old vehicle tires, it will all be covered in detail and, uh, and uh, then to, to uh, control the flying debris and reducing the air overpressure, all those um, uh, geo, geofabrics or geotextiles have been used. Then all the preparatory work for pre-demolition and we have done because it is one of its kinds and the tallest one in whole Asia, I think, and the first of its kind in India. So we wanted to capture every bit of scientific information uh, through instrumentation. So we have gone for heavy instrumentation of the whole process. And the stakeholders in this, as I told, the NOIDA Authority overall uh, <clears throat> support from NOIDA Authority, and then CSR, CBRI, and CSR SIMPAR, then the, both the um, resident welfare association, ECORBA and ATS village, then edifice engineering, jet demolition, Gas Authority of India, Supertech India Private Limited. And I was talking about the exclusion zone. We, we made in a way that where the traffic will not face a problem, it can be easily diverted for at least during the demolition or preparation time. And, and so we made a, a trapezoidal thing where one is 250 meter by 450 meter, you can say. So, so this is the exclusion zone and we have to take care of every safety in this zone. And for this, we have fixed where will be the emergency services, emergency assembly viewpoint, where will be road closure, where will be the initiation point, where will be the blasting zone, because uh, we have to trigger the blast. So it can be 100 meter, 150 meter. So from which side? it will be um, uh, triggering will be done. So every aspect, we are in close association with the NOIDA authority, district administration, the whole police department, NDRF, SDRF, everything was perfectly in line in coordination to, to, to contribute to this perfection. The exclusion zone, we, 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 uh, I, I, I was uh, telling that the, the, the uh, critical zone, it was 50 meter radius, we have to evacuate everything. And there are elderly people who are bedridden, they have to be shifted to the safer places. So hospitals were booked and other people, they have booked the hotels or some nearby relatives. So morning they will evacuate and by evening. 2.30 p.m. on 28th August 2022. The demolition has to occur. And we told that, that the, the evacuation will be completed by, by 9 a.m. in the morning of, of 28th August. And they can come back latest by 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. on the instruction from the whole team. <clears throat> 
And these are the twin towers. I will not go into the details. We had a predicted what will be the debris pile and how it will affect the sideway near a structure and what will be the protection measures. And this is the area of concern which where we have to contain all the debris, demolish debris, and we have to observe the vibration within this ground. And we will not allow the vibration or air overpressure beyond our Indian standards or, or other standards available so that we can ensure the safety of the surrounding structures. So we used how, how to contain the fly debris or, or air overpressure. Then we also safeguarded the dust will be huge. So how the dust can be protected to affect to the, the, the surrounding building. So draping of geotextiles in the surrounding structures all those cares have been taken and, and you can see the surrounding structures as well as twin towers. What sort of precautions geotextile fabrics has been used. And you can see after the, the, the demolition, the debris footprint in the, in the side and you can see the structure which was nine meter distance. Not a single debris has tossed the structure, but a, a, a portion has tossed the, the, the protective measure. We have taken a retaining wall. So, so this is a, a perfection in that. And you can see the whole a class of engineering perfection. You can see on both sides the structures, which has damaged only few glasses in the windows and all these things. And, and a four to five meter length of boundary wall of ATS village. And the moment it got demolished, within 10 seconds, the, the, the CMD of Gale was sitting with us. And he told that within 10 seconds, that my Gale gas pipeline is to absolutely perfect. There is no pressure change in the Gale gas pipeline. And we could see how it is falling. The way it was pulled, the direction it, it was planned to be pulled and fall, we could see visually from a distance of 200 meters from a viewpoint zone. And just after 15 minutes, the, the whole core team was at the site. We assessed the area and then we, we informed the CEO of Noida and district administration to, to start the cleaning process. And by 4.30, we started people returning to, to their own house. <clears throat> So this is the team I have already introduced and you can see the, 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 the way we have done it and uh, such a heavy structure. And, and this is a marvel in the Indian history. You can say it. And, and I salute these people. You won't believe with 3000 kg of explosives already loaded in two towers, these people by foot were moving from the ground floor up to the 34th floor under the loaded explosives condition. So I really salute the whole team and the laborers even who are involved contributed to the whole process. Thank you very much. And finally, it is really a satisfaction of engineering marvel. The credit goes to the, the science, scientific principles, engineering uh, uh, tools and techniques or, or advanced technology. We are proud of our nation that we have developed to such extent. And the last and the important thing is the faith of our own people in the whole team. They were just telling before the media that you are the God for us you only can save us. So that is the faith in the Indian system, Indian community, on the scientific community. So thank you very much. Yeah, I think we'll move to the uh, next presentation. And it will be uh, uh, by Dr. Devadatta Ghosh. And he will he is a principal scientist and in CSR Central Building Research Institute with, with structural engineering expertise. And he will talk about all the structural engineering aspects 
in the safe demolition process. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Sanuguji, one request. Sanuguji? Yes, sir. Yeah, one request. I think you monitor the time so that we uh, plan to finish uh, uh, in the given okay, time, okay. one o'clock. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, sir, my screens are visible. Yes, visible. Yeah, Please yeah. go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Take uh, 10 15 minutes to finish your test. Yes, sir. I'll try to finish it within 10 minutes. Uh, sir, uh, you said like uh, basically when uh, Supreme Court order for this uh, demolition, uh, basically safe demolition, Noida approached us for how it's to be demolished. There are several proposals from mechanical demolition to combination of uh, blasting and uh, mechanical. Several process, uh, proposals were assessed, and at that time, our director, Dr. Gopal Kishan, said, along with our team, uh, it was observed based on the surrounding scenario, the building implosion is the perfect uh, way to demolish. And here, structural engineering or the uh, structural aspects are very important. And with this introduction, I'd like to uh, discuss about the what are the structural aspects we take care during the de demolition process. So uh, you can see with the growing uh, construction, there is a demolition need in the country throughout. And that is due to violation of land laws, as you mentioned, sir. And other thing we are coming across in throughout country, like aging of the structure is a very uh, problematic issue right now, along with inadequate design and of structures, construction of structures, construction practice somewhere due to chloride in the structures got corroded fully, their demolitions becoming necessary. And as well as sometimes construction plan changes. Suppose owners wants to uh, uh, do uh, construct some multi-story instead of some a smaller height building, there also we need demolition. In disaster prone areas also we observed in the Josie mode also, like buildings are, uh, uh, are in danger because of landslide and all. And because of that, we need to demolish it. And with this is the this is how uh, India is investing uh, its GDP in the infrastructure. And along with that, you get you can see Supreme Court is and other high courts are also ordering demolitions because of many bylaws issues as as well as uh, building issues. So with this background, we can see if our planning is not correct, our engineering is not correct, what can happen? And a perfect how a perfect demolition means. If it is a perfect demolition, you can see the building will fall within its debris footprint. So debris, what is debris footprint? It's a, a, a expected area of fall or expected boundary of fall where the debris is to be uh, uh, fall after that implosion. So this is another example where it was a failed demolition, partial demolition. So you can understand how difficult was the super tech twin tower demolition in this case you can see one building uh, collapsed another building uh, stayed uh, partially inclined or something like that we'll see similar good example of demolition this is called implosion so you can see all the building components are imploded inside and it is falling within the footprint similarly another fine, funny example you can see some of the building is falling. So we analyze all these case studies throughout the world. And based on uh, the analysis, we found out uh, J demolition and uh, uh, edifice, all they, since they have already demolished uh, uh, some buildings in Kochi, and they have the expertise since very uh, J demolition is doing throughout the world. We decided that there will be uh, uh, the demolition agency for this, and Noida accepted it as it, it was decided by us. So, in the demolition, this is to be uh, taken care of. Something is called blast zone, where the blasting will be happening. So, this is marked as a one. Second is debris, uh, debris direct debris impact zone, where the debris will fall. So, because of this free fall, you can understand due to gravity, there will be a zone where debris will be falling. There is a, another zone that is called total debris zone. So total debris zone, including the flying debris and all, whatever debris will be generated, uh, including fly out, uh, uh, that, that, that will call as a uh, total debris zone. There is a buffer zone. Beyond this total debris zone, we call something is called buffer zone. This, uh, this much is a buffer zone. And 
also uh, encompassing this all zone there is something is called exclusion zone where mm -hmm. no uh, uh, habitat uh, no uh, animal no person will be allowed during the demolition process so that we call is a exclusion zone and the uh, 250 meter of exclusion zone that dr karan has already explained so uh, demolition is a science is all about optimum harnessing the uh, optimum harnessing of the gravitational potential energy by means of gravitational uh, potential energy we will bring it down with some uh, inclination or in particular direction something like that here i'll try to show one ex example he, here is a small building plan where if we charge explosive and demolish the, uh, try to demolish this building in, in a particular direction we have to do it in a such a way we have to give some delays like first this column will go then this column will go and these delays are not in seconds it is in milliseconds or in microseconds so that you will not even understand like the uh, difference between the two subsequent blasting but you will observe there is a fall in a particular direction like here it is you can see we have in a simulation manner uh, uh, th this has been carried out by dr sumon in our group and you can observe how uh, demolition plan has been done in this so one by one uh, column uh, removal scenario has been uh, executed here and you can see a particular directional force similarly for chimneys and other structure we can see in particular dire directions you have to remove the material as well as you have to uh, uh, make sure that stiffness of that element is zero and accordingly it will fall and it will fall in a gravitational pull so a disaster management plan has to be uh, based on your computer added tool. So whatever, uh, what if scenario? So what if scenarios are like, if this happened, what will happen? So that kind of scenario is to be analyzed in a computer program or with your experiences. And accordingly, you execute your blast plan. Here also, we can see during blasting, you'll also get some kind of ground vibrations. Here it is, you can observe like when it is falling, ground is also impacted with this kind of debris uh, uh, because of these falling uh, building elements the ground vibration will be generated and because of these ground vibration the structures near about should be also safe otherwise those structures there will be consecutive failures of the structures also so those also being analyzed this is the finite element model of the twin tower and that was analyzed uh, uh, before the actual demolitions by us also uh, based on the inputs given by uh, jet demolition and edifice engineering. So uh, this is how the collapse mechanism or the structural engineering will work. Like uh, uh, you find out a particular collapse mechanism or based on your earlier data or the experiences, you try to find out the what it will be the collapse mechanism. Then you have to pre-weaken the structure by means of uh, some cutting some walls. Uh, by reducing the stiffness of the structure because there are certain rigid elements and for the super tech it was a very rigid structure since it is a uh, 32 story structure 32 story and 30 story structure and it has a rigid CR walls only there are no columns in this structure so then you can go for some kind of virtual test blast to understand the powder factor what is powder factor uh, how much charge is required to demolish one meter cube or one ton of uh, concrete so based on this, you put decide the delay, the delay sequence. So that will be discussed in the our next speaker. Speaker will be elaborating those uh, things. So uh, based on that, you decide the sequence of uh, blastings as well as you can sequence uh, the isochronic lines. Isochronic lines are these lines which are fall uh, having a similar delays. So these are called isochronic lines. So based on the isochronic line, the sequence will be decided. So the surrounding evaluation is also important along with the demolition. Environmental protection plan also is important. So all these things are being taken care of. These details already uh, Dr. Kaunga has given and you can see the strength of the concrete 30 to 30, uh, 40 MPa and all are CR wall structure. Whatever is visible is all are CR wall. And you can also see the uh, area where structure is to be pull down like you can see he has expl explained to you about uh, waterfall effect so waterfall effect has to be executed in this direction only since we have some space over here otherwise this side 40 story uh, you can see the near about st other structures like 9 meter the uh, uh, ecorba side towers 28 meter 1 meter is the um, ats village towers so 
since the building height is also 30 meter there is a high chance this building may fall over any of this tower so there will be other hazards along with that that there was a gale pipeline which was going in this directions which was operating under operation in 4.6 mp of pressure so that also we have to take care of like what is to be done so next uh, uh, speakers will talk about that but main thing i want to say like structural engineers has to ensure that building should fall in these directions the pull of the uh, fall was in this direction that is in south west directions so this is you can see how it's pre awakening is done in this building so you can see there is a uh, continuous shear wall Uh, say in nine meter uh, length or uh, six meter length, so that is to be cut in between to weaken the uh, building. So along with this weakening, we have to uh, drill uh, holes, continuous hole, up to one end to another end uh, for charging the explosives. So these are the different charging hole. So those, uh, so over this uh, hole, the explosive will be. Uh, inserted and accordingly the charging will be takes place so these are the zone and over this um, uh, uh, column or cr wall we have to place this geotextile along with uh, uh, along with wire mesh to ensure that it should not come out the, uh, the, that is the optimum optimum use of the explosives otherwise if the energy got released definitely the effectiveness will be not that much so this is explaining uh, what is the location of the ats village korba towers and the apex and cn buildings and this is how you can see the uh, uh, geotextile is in alternate floor so alternate floor where blast floors wherever there is a blast floor you can see that those has been colored as in geotextile or is uh, wrapped with geotextile so that no uh, particle should come out during although there will be some particle but still the maximum particle should be arrested as well as it can create a uh, blast over uh, minimize the uh, air over pressure also so you can see at the basement we um, uh, intentionally put uh, blast floors continuously to, so that to crush the basement completely and uh, along with that we had uh, blast floors and uh, in uh, alternate floors as well as in the stair case area we had continuous blast floors and this is how the connection is being done in the uh, 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 with the detonators so this is showing the some connection with the uh, individual blast holes explosives and all and during this process of weakening the structure is safe if some earthquake comes there may be if, if there there will be uh, a much danger you can understand like if, if that, that time some uh, uh, earthquake suddenly appear that time the structure is already have, weakened you have two to three minutes more yes sir uh, so that time uh, so uh, for pre weakening structure we have modeled this apex and cn tower and we have assessed the safety and accordingly uh, we have checked it is safe under any kind of earthquake or any scenario so, similar, similarly there are near about structures so due to the falling of this uh, uh, building uh, the apex and cn tower the near building should also be safe so we have done a detailed structural audit pre and post so pre uh, pre audit we found the building is not uh, adequate enough to uh, withstand this kind of uh, vibration due to blast so because of that we suggested remedial measures this is how we have done uh, get it done the analysis of this uh, uh, near about buildings because of this uh, vibration predicted vibrations so as per that we have also retrofitted the uh, next buildings using different uh, techniques uh, wrapping and other things so uh, uh, after ensuring all these things are safe we allowed for the yeah. so this is how the pre awakening is weak, uh, uh, shown this is the blast hole the locations i'll also explain another important thing that is called test blast so to ensure how much uh, specific charge or how much optimum charge is required to demolish the individual um, uh, cr wall so that is basically a site specific study so for site specific uh, study a test blast was conducted you can see in this uh, and because of so this is how you can see uh, some columns is only uh, like some reinforcement is already bu buckled because of this test blast so that happened before in the month of uh, april before the original blast so this same thing is in also model in uh, computer uh, through fem modeling uh, dr suman has carried out 
and it was observed the whatever the specific charge is given is uh, well enough for the fall so this is how the isochronic lines uh, have been decided based on the uh, or test blast input and uh, 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 convention of fall in particular directions this is zero second one second two second this is how this has been characterized and for the cn building it is like that and so based the combinedly it will give a some kind of waterfall effect as i was mentioned in the simulation and it is also seen here also so uh, here uh, you can see uh, because of this uh, uh, this is how uh, it has been modeled in a uh, fine element software and you can see this building is coming down with time and because of this uh, isochronic uh, lines and uh, sequential blast this is how it, it has been done so uh, in our lab also we assess the uh, whatever being proposed is correct or not uh, in a very technical and scientific manner so this is how it has been done so it will take much time so i'll just proceed and we also uh, see the predicted debris profile whether it will fall within the debris footprint or not and also uh, uh, the building were separated out uh, between these two to uh, ensure there is no transfer of uh, loading or vibration to the adjacent buildings so after test plus you can see the uh, kind of increment in uh, a number of holes drill diameters and all these things uh, the, the mr utkars maybe uh, detail detail he will be discuss, discussing all these things so i think i have covered how it has been uh, ensured so in april uh, this was some kind of schedule of the uh, uh, their planning so on 28 uh, it was the uh, final demolition day and that day uh, we NC, this is how it was done as i was explaining about the waterfall effect and the particular direction of pool you can see that demolition has started from these directions in a, a isochronic manner and it is coming in this way and you can see that dust cloud and all even after this uh, geotextile dripping this happened and this explained already by dr kanunbo i will li also like to explain here you can see uh, the in the cn uh, uh, tower there was certain floor which were not charged with explosive so it was expected that this tower will just fall over it and it will stand uh, over the debris pile but although it got tilted so it was just didn't work uh, as we planned it, it just crossed our debris footprint at a certain location only but otherwise it was a very perfect uh, demolition execution even you can see the plan layout here It, it, uh, that debris didn't fall even in that zone so it was that kind of accuracy to happen i'll also explain some of the instrumentation that we put in the structures as well as from the outside we have done some uh, monitoring like using digital and thermal camera uh, using seismograph already uh, uh, dr harsh verma will explain those things and we put also uh, uh, dr miki along with his team we, uh, put uh, lots of black boxes in the structures to uh, observe the vibrations and acceleration of the falling mass during the uh, uh, building demolition so those things we carried out also we did a pre and post demolition uh, drone survey to create a three and try to estimate the volume of debris how much volume will be falling and that also you can see in the three that uh, building has been mapped and uh, after the debris fall uh, this is also estimated how much debris is generated due to the fall so those kind of exercise also we carried out so the thermal imaging was done to uh, find out whether the demolition or the blasting is happening in a correct way or not so we can see in this uh, images as demolition is uh, like uh, blasting is progressing yeah sir i done last slide only uh, so this is how it has been done and finally uh, collaboration is the way so for uh, from pre demolition exercise to finally uh, accomplishing the task this is how it was the journey so thank you very much uh so now next speaker can take over uh, you can answer your uh, presentation yeah so <clears throat> now uh, the next speaker is dr manujit samanta who is a uh, principal scientist uh, and geotechnical expert uh, in central building research institute and he will talk about all the geotechnical aspects what uh, measures we have taken to to make it a safe demolition what i um, told what it is meant 
So, uh, Dr. Manoj Samanta, please. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, can anyone tell that uh, my uh, uh, screen is visible? I am audible. It's visible and audible. You can go okay. ahead. Thank you. So, uh, 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 in uh, uh, past, uh, no, previous two speakers have talked about in general about the uh, structural uh, demolition, uh, demolition of the twin tower. Dr. Debrath has talked about the various structural aspect and uh, and the instrumentation aspect. So, mostly I will talk about here the foundation system of the twin tower and safety and disaster management plan for a uh, uh, gale pipeline. And some of the geotechnical aspects, which include basically the uh, laying of the cushion system and to absorb the seismic, uh, uh, the absorb the impact uh, impact of the uh, from the falling uh, uh, debris. So uh, basically, uh, if you uh, uh, see that uh, for uh, foundation design of the twin tower, only uh, eleven borehole was done at different location, and borehole was a depth of up to twenty meter. And uh, uh, disturbed and undisturbed samples were taken at regular interval, and uh, uh, water table was found at to be uh, at to be a five meter uh, below the ground level, natural ground level, and mostly uh, soil was in. Uh, if you see the SPTN value, uh, the base SPTN value from the top of the up to a depth of twenty meter varies very uh, at the top around on zero to three meter. It varies from. 5 to 20 and at the end uh, at the end at the depth of 20 meter it very it, it go uh, went up to uh, up to 20 20 to 30 30 so uh, we, we, as a, as a whole we, we can say that it is not a very stiff soil uh, as the spd n value is varies from 20 to 30 you can see the only the three types of soil layer was there uh, the fine sand uh, uh, with uh, uh, silty sand and uh, silty uh, sandy silt and silty sand uh, the fine sand was of the poorly uh, graded sand and mostly uh, mostly the top soil layer was sand uh, with uh, sand percentage varying from 80 to 90 per 98 percent and uh, after that the clay percentage was uh, more so it was on the on the on the sandy sandy silt or silty sand kind of thing where the clay percentage silt and clay percentage was from 50 to 90 percent or 20 to uh, 20 to 48 percent. Cohesion was almost zero. Uh, expect the that in the in the MLCL category where the silt content was more. So there there the cohesion value was 10 to 20. And angle of internal friction that was measured through the uh, triaxial test uh, it was varies between the 30 to 30. 30 uh, in the in the range of uh, 29 to 34 degrees so so we can say it is a medium dense sand conditions and uh, for uh, for apex tower uh, the three foundation system was uh, was basically designed uh, or basically uh, options or three foundation system on on the uh, on, on the shallow or combined foundations one was the wrapped foundation and and then one was the pile of foundations but what happened is that in the wrapped foundation settlement was around 120 mm so Oh, uh, against a permission settlement of 75 mm in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the sand uh, sand poisonless soil, so it, this has been ruled out and wrapped was at a depth of 7 meter. Then uh, what uh, has been done is that, that in strategically uh, 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 strategic location of the wrapped that is under the under the uh, the uh, column and under the CR walls, the pile were placed uh, uh, following the principle of creep piling. Those who know the pile lab design, so in creep piling, basically the piles is loaded up to eighty to hundred percent of the hundred percent of load utilization. So here uh, again, analyzing in the finite element analysis, the settlement was in the tune of forty to forty five mm. So it was it was uh, considered acceptable. And then pile load test was done. Uh, diameter of the pile was 750 mm. A length, a length up to it, uh, up to 27 meter. Uh, and safe compression capacity in the compression it was to 200 ton. Uh, uh, grade was 30 MPa. So uh, IS 291 was was, uh, was uh, 1985 because it was uh, done around 2005. So 1985 code was uh, was uh, followed and. In the safe capacity, uh, following the two criteria of the IS uh, 2911, safe capacity was coming out to be 232 ton. So this is the uh, this is the pile wrap of the apex tower. You can see the total area is approximately uh, wrapped area is approximately 2076 meter square. Number of pile was 2205, and working load was pile is varying between 
20 to 230 ton. So it was mostly piles were designed were as a creep piling in pile principles, um, uh, where the piles were taking almost uh, uh, mobilization was pile uh, load was almost 80 to 100 percent. This was the CN tower uh, where here the load was little less, so only the raft foundation was planned at a depth of seven meter. And uh, next stage, we will talk about the safety assessment of the buried pipeline, uh, that is the gale pipeline. So uh, the, uh, they, they, there was a gale pipeline, uh, uh, pipeline for 450 mm diameter, which was uh, operating under a pressure of 4.9 MPa gas pressure. It was the uh, closest of this pipe was around 16 meter from the, at a distance of 16 meter from the tower, CN tower. And it was at a depth of three meter, uh, and uh, the gale has informed that it should not be the uh, the gas supply should not be stopped or must not be stopped during the demolition. So it was very important to to safety or making sure that this pipeline is safe. This is the uh, debris profile, uh, uh, assumed debris profile uh, after falling. So you can see that. This is the two tower uh, 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 footprint of the two tower uh, before demolition, and this is the uh, retaining wall, uh, retaining brick wall of the ATS village. Uh, this is the retaining brick uh, brick wall of uh, of ATS village, uh, ATS ATS village, and before that, towards the uh, 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 towards the uh, uh, tower, uh, it was the. Uh, steel uh, buried steel gas pipeline of 450 mm diameter operating as a spacer, operating as a spacer of uh, internal spacer of 4.9 MPa. Uh, it uh, most maximum operating pressure was 9.8 MPa and the uh, uh, maximum pressure and allowable pressure was and the operating was 4.9 MPa. And during uh, during implosion, uh, it was expected that the debris will touch the pipelines at two locations. At two locations, uh, one uh, at two location, one was uh, of and it is estimated that it will be of four meter length, one point six meter height, and 0 0.7, uh, 0 0 0.7 point seven point five meter of uh, width uh, height. Uh, sorry, uh, height at one location, and another location, another location, it will be of uh, of five meter of length. 1.5 meter of width and 1 meter of height at another locations. So uh, 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 the uh, the pipeline at the operating conditions should be safe due to the self weight of the debris, uh, due to the gravity weight of the debris after accumulations. Also during the impact of the debris after uh, during the accumulation during the falling of the debris. So what the measures has so been taken? Get the three minutes. Huh? Yes. So what the measures has been taken is that uh, that uh, uh, all over the pipeline we have put a three mm thick five meter uh, five mm width uh, five meter width of uh, 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 this is the uh, gale pipeline and uh, we have taken uh, five meter width of uh, uh, steel pipeline so that the pressure from this pipe the pace, the debris that is to be accumulated over this pipeline uh, over this uh, plate should be distributed. Uniformly, not in a uh, not in a uh, sharp increase should be pressure. So, trapezoidal manner, the pressure should be distributed in increment uh, distributed uniform manner. And this is the protect protection of barn. The, it will be five meter of uh, uh, five meter of uh, width uh, uh, at the bottom and at the top two meter of uh, two meter of the width, and it should be have a height of two meter. So this is the uh, we have uh, uh, basically uh, the uh, the finite element analysis of heat has been done. In different stages, that is the uh, rheostatic stresses, then static analysis, gravity load on the pi, uh, pipeline, gra gradual backfilling simulations, then static analysis of the bullet pipeline, including the gravity loads, then the debris load over uh, is applied over the pipeline, analysis of the wave propagations uh, by demolition of the buildings. So these are the conditions, uh, as I told, that the pipe diameter is 450 uh, mm, nominal thickness is 9.5 meter, uh, then soil condition was fine sand, uh, loosely, uh, loose, uh, dense, medium dense sand soil condition, operating pressure was 9.8 uh, uh, MPa, and then uh, design pressure was 9.8 MPa, operating pressure was 4.9 uh, MPa. Then uh, these are the factors that has been taken, I will not go into details, uh, uh, details of much of it. And then uh, 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 for the for the safety purposes, what we have done is that uh, what was the debris profile at the two locations? We have taken uh, 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 double of it. That uh, maximum height was one meter, so we have taken two meter of the debris uh, debris profile of it. 
and you can see that uh, oh, the analysis has, been, has also been done at the different uh, operating pressure that is uh, zero operating pressure 30 mp operating pressure uh, 30 percent of the operating pressures that is 49 4.9 mp 70 percent and 100 percent and uh, the maximum stress that is the bending stress uh, maybe in, in, in the compression or in the tension or the hoop stress basically has been calculated and it has been compared with the allowable stresses and you can see that there is a much of difference though it has uh, and 100 percent capacity it is much of difference but the recommendation was that that to reduce that to take it any unconscious activity the pipe should be operated a 70 percent 30 percent less of the operating pressure that is a 70 percent at 70 percent to take into any unforeseen activities so you can see that uh, uh, this is the debris uh, this is the uh, embankment earth bomb earth bomb was created over the pipelines and to further reduce the uh, 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 the uh, impact to, uh, to further reduce the seismic wave uh, uh, impact impact wave impact shock wave from the impact the tires at the uh, uh, two locations the, where the debris were to be expected to fall in the uh, come within the pipe over the pipeline was also uh, also uh, kept and these are the loose material uh, taken from the native soil uh, kept it in a loose condition so that the uh, impact from the debris to be absorbed within the uh, gale pipeline uh, uh, with, uh, to be within the gale, uh, to be within the permissible li limit of the for the gale pipeline and he heavily instrumented as a, as my previous speaker dr devdath has been uh, has shown that a uh, heavily instrumented uh, through the geophones uh, has been done to know the peak particle velocity in and around the pipeline that will be shown by uh, our uh, next speaker dr uh, harshwam from simpar so uh, these are the uh, this information has been taken from a different report that has been submitted to cbri for technical evaluations with this i will stop thank you Yeah, thank you, Dr. Manojit. Now the next speaker, speaker is from CSIR Simfar team, and uh, Dr. Harsh Verma is a senior principal scientist uh, in Simfar uh, Bilaspur um, uh, Center, and he will present the work of both uh, Dr. Somliana and and uh, his own contribution, the contribution from Simfar side. So, Dr. Uh, Harsh, please. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Karan uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, audible and visible. You can okay. go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. So I'll quickly see, uh, I basically belong to Central Institute of Mining and Field Research. Uh, I'm at Bilaspur Center. We have got a headquarters at Dhanbad. Uh, our teammate, Dr. Samliana, is also in the link. So uh, without going into much details, what I will go is, let's I will briefly touch upon the background, the major challenges, and as far as uh, the regulatory standards of the vibration is concerned, that I would like to elaborate, uh, discuss, uh, and then the assessment and prediction of ground vibration. What are the factors, how it affects, and the mitigation measures, what the textbook says, and what are the things that we have followed here, and finally the conclusion. So gradually, one by one, it will not be exactly in the order, but we will try to cover all the suspects. The issue here is basically, uh, when Simper came into road, uh, the idea was basically given the expertise available on drilling and blasting operation used in mining industry. Uh, we have a setup from formulation of explosive to testing of explosive, and all those things are available with Simper. So we have been assigned a job to see that whatever blast and patterns are being uh, proposed by the agency, demolition agency, uh, that is to be reviewed. And if any, any suggestion is the, to be given, that has to be incorporated. So idea it was a operation to review the entire operation of drilling and blasting. Quickly, I will tell you this uh, with respect to the vibration aspect. See, the as uh, Dr. Debu has already mentioned, it was completely a shear wall construction with heavy reinforcement. If you find it was used, so the building is very very robust, and uh, the quantity of concrete is it's more than around eighty thousand. Uh, the major challenge that we have faced as far as vibration is concerned is basically proximity of various structures. Now, as has been explained already, there are uh, structures uh, close to apex tower, same tower, the close distance 9 meter. Then there is a step 3, which is hardly a distance of 15 meter. Uh, the gas pipeline, what Dr. Uh, Manojit was explaining to us, it was one of the major challenge, how to reduce the impact on this uh, operational gas pipeline. Then there are buildings, ATS 6A building, ATS 7 building. 
So these are all the buildings. You can see the distance was no say as close as nine meter, and uh, our major concern was distance up to 34, 35 meters like that. So how to control the vibration and to take care so that whatever vibration is being uh, generated during this operation that actually remains well within the limits there should not be any damage potential in the vibration so that was the task so with that task in the background all the geotechnical studies that have been carried by our colleague from cbri uh, the structural study that has been uh, carried out by the sector team so with all those inputs we could identify the problematic parts you know what are the areas where some retrofittings are required or what are the uh, areas wherein the factor of safety has to be increased Although permissible limit may be a little higher, but uh, then the vibration has to be reduced to another uh, lower level so that uh, the vibration does not have any problem on any of these structures. So before that, I will just touch upon uh, some of the things of blast design, which was actually correlated with the vibration impact. First thing that we'll have to understand is basically identification of the load bearing elements and then the combination of mechanical and implosion techniques. So what does it mean actually? That means once we have identified the structure of the load bearing elements, then to mechanically disintegrate it with the main body of the structures. Say for example, these two towers are connected with each other. So that has to be disintegrated. Then there are uh, say, for example, structures uh, which was used for the lift that has to be you know uh, disconnected with each other. Then there is a ladder running from top to bottom that has to be disconnected. So mechanically, it, all these things were actually uh, uh, disintegrated. And then primary and secondary blasts were planned. It was planned in such a way what we call this is a waterfall blast mechanism to break the concrete and to pull it in a certain direction. <laughs> that was a fundamental idea. So for that, a significant amount of you know, exercise was done to ensure that what should be the delay, how the charging pattern should be done. All those, uh, no, we have uh, the Dr. Joe, he was uh, the master in doing all this exercise. So all those exercises were meticulously planned. And then it was evaluated in terms of what will be the level of vibration with this plan, what will be the level of damage potential this vibration will carry to the nearby structures, say Ikaro Towers. And uh, with the geotechnical investigation that has been done in the uh, site, it was found that the structures was weak, actually weak when the permissible limit of vibration has to be reduced. So those with all these inputs, this blast design was planned. I will not go into more details because Dr. Joe is the one who has done all the exercise. So possibly he'll be the right person to talk on this issue. I will stick to vibration part. So you can see the same tower, basically, it was firing somewhere from 0 to 3.5 seconds. Then the apex tower that was firing from 0 to 7. So this entire episode was supposed to be finished within the span of 10 seconds. And that exactly I'm going to show you in vibration record also how it has been perfectly executed. <clears throat> so the drilling and blasting exercise, if we look at to the details, the whole diameter was close to 34 mm. Uh, 25 diameter uh, small cartridge exposures were used. Uh, most of the part was basically this PET and uh, uh, detonating fuse, we call it basically, uh, close to 83 grams per meter. Then we had an initiation system which consisted of short delay due to a nonal system, which is basically non electric system. And then long delay system was there. Final firing was done with the help of electrical detonators. Uh, altogether, the number of holes were around 9,640 holes. The depth was varying from 1.5 meter to 2 meter, like that. Explosive quantity total used was around uh, 3.7 <coughs> tons. Total duration of the blast, as I said, uh, is going to be finished within 10 seconds time. And uh, these are all the pictures you can see. For those actually who have not actually can get an idea of what actually it looks like, the long delay series, the short delay series, the detonating fuses, the small diameter cartridge, all these holes were used. And they were the ones <laughs> who were actually utilized meticulously, planned in each hole uh, with. Uh, the inputs like you know the first trial bus was carried out. We got certain experience on those uh, output. How much explosive will be required to further strengthen and to get the explosion in a perfect order? So this exercise was done. <laughs> and during this hard exercise, three minutes more. Okay. <clears throat> so in this exercise, the most important part was basically <clears throat> 
the reduction of mass of colostrum mass because that is the one factor that actually influences or uh, uh, the vibration intensity. So there are a large number of uh, vibration prediction. If you go to the uh, textbook, you will find number of equations are there. Uh, what I want to uh, show here is basically the vibration induced will not exactly be proportional directly to the explosive per delay or amount of explosive per delay or charge per delay, but it is basically the collapsible mass that will be hitting the ground. That actually is a major factor and that controls the entire vibration intensity at a certain distance. So what we used to do is now we have this understanding it is a mass which is going to roll this entire story. So we have tried to reduce the collapsible mass in a such a way that the vibration induced by this remains to a oh, significantly lower level. Then, of course, reducing charge per delay was an important exercise as a part of the blast design. Another important part is basically well prepared falling bed. Uh, falling bed, this is what I have tried to show here. Uh, Dr. Manjit was also talking about the same thing, you know. So, this is not just a random trench, it is basically an engineered trench. When we talk about the vibration, normally the trench design is in such a way that the wavelength of uh, actually wave is <clears throat> uh, smaller than this, uh, the size of the trench. So that has to be done actually. So this makes a almost 30% reduction in the vibration. So with this background, uh, the exercise was done on the prediction of vibration as well as your pressure. And if you see these tables, you can see that the most likely vibration at a distance of 10 meters, say a e quarter hour, e hour. So it's around 22 uh, to 25 like that. Maximum likely was around 34 mm per second. So this was the uh, peak particle velocity. <coughs> Similarly, there was exercise that was carried out with the help of uh, no, different empirical correlations to find out what will be the level of air or pressure because that is also going to have some problem. There are buildings which are very, very close to it. Uh, so this two exercise was done. Now, with this exercise, uh, then what are the different standards that is available? Uh, they propose that uh, uh, with the help of this British standards, these are all the values here around 50 mm per second of uh, peak particle velocity within a frequency range of 4 to 15 hertz. Uh, that may be allowed for the RCC structures or uh, industrial heavy reinforcement buildings. If the vibration is uh, frequencies having more than 15 hertz, possibly we may go a little higher. So these are all the things, those exercises were there, but we insisted on certain things to keep the vibration level low, the permissible limit as per our Indian standards. We tried to restrict it to less than 25 millimeters per second, because that is what our standard says. Now, with this exercise, we went for a meticulous planning on <coughs> vibration monitoring. So uh, almost 19 system, uh, different seismographs with tricell transducers we have utilized at different different locations. This is the plan you can see all around this from S close there's around 10 meters to almost 190 meters of this entire zone were completely instrumented and we could get a very good results on each at each of these points. I will show you some of the results also. Uh, but before that, what we have uh, used that I would like to say. It's basically velocity transducers, not displacement transducers, because we all know velocity is the one parameter which is directly correlated with the damage potential. So we have got three types of instruments, Minimate Plus, Minimate Plus, and Minimate. They're all basically from instrumental. And this is uh, the specification. You can see we can record a vibration as low as 0.127 mm per second, and it can go right up to 254 mm per second. Dr. Hertz, one minute. OK. So now this I would like to share with you all. You can see at uh, some of the locations we have quickly tried to you know, tabulate the value. These are all the three components of the vibration, transverse, vertical, and longitudinal at different different locations. What I would like to show here is you see a step two building. See at the basement it was 7.8, then at the middle it was 7.74, at the top floor 10.3. The 34, the, the seismograph which was at a 34 meter. Uh, ahead just in front of the road, that is 13.55. <clears throat> Maximum value was 18.92. Oh, sorry, longitudinal 22.86. Similarly, at a distance, it, it moved out 190 meters in the park. Uh, the maximum value that could be recorded is basically 6.73. So this is one observation that the vibrations remain well within the permissible limit. It is as we have predicted. And another thing is if you see uh the velocity time history of the vibration that has been recorded you can see this is almost 10 second of line and all the vibration attenuated within 10 milliseconds 
so that is how exactly it has actually been done the way it is planned yeah. uh, another issue is basically the flying fragments uh, this has already been dealt in details the use of geotextile fabrics but one important part is basically at the inner core uh, the opening of this geotextiles uh, or the mess has to be very very small and the outer layer may be slightly more and then finally it has to be wrapped to control the flying fragments number one and also to reduce air over pressure so this i think uh, has already explained so these are all the things that i wanted to explain uh, can i run the video no so uh, this is what our team from simfer of course along with the, our team from the uh, cbri these are all my fellow colleagues from simfer who have contributed in this work and it was a pleasure uh, doing the job with a very very coordinated teamwork from cbri and simfer so with this i conclude only thing that i wanted to add on here is basically when we drape the uh, the geotextile material around the building because of the higher wind velocity some of the uh, the drape geotextile material they actually fall on the surface and that has actually you know created some problem some of the window panes glass panes that has broken down that was the reason so if any exercise is being done in the close proximity of any building uh, i will i will ensure that to take part uh, to take care of this particular issue so that any draping material that should not come down before the final blast so with this i conclude thank you very much thank you dr karan yeah dr hars you can on share your presentation sure Dr. Harz, unshare yeah. your presentation. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, I'm just removing it, yes. Awesome. Unshare? No. Not yet? Not yet. Okay, some problem is there. What I will do is actually, I will just... still not on share yeah yeah <clears throat> now now we will move forward with with the um, uh, technical lecture by edifice engineering and jet demolition so uh, mr utkarsh mehta who, who is the owner of edifice engineering they they are the uh, uh, responsible for the pro whole project management and and along with uh, jet demolition uh, south africa so i invite uh, mr utkarsh mehta kindly start your presentation thank you thank you sir thank you uh, audible as well as yeah it's it's audible and visible okay uh, first of all uh, good afternoon to all uh, and i would like to thank on my behalf as well as uh, jet demolition kate and uh, joe for inviting us to this uh, wonderful uh, lecture come uh, panel discussion which is down the line and we are part of this uh, success story which we have jointly achieved uh, uh, i i don't remember in our careers of last uh, 15 18 years that we had this kind of a project wherein there were so many stakeholders involved and uh, jointly we were able to reach or achieve the target which we envisaged on day 1 uh, Mr. Utkars, can you raise your volume a bit? Okay. It is showing 100%, sir. I will try to be close to this. Is it okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I was I was just wanted to thank the team uh, jointly uh, for the efforts which we have put in for the six months, first six months. And today we are sitting on the result which the whole world is looking at. Uh, we are proud to be associated with uh, CSIR, uh, CBRI, SIMFER, and many other uh, associations which we had during the tenure of those six months. Uh, moving on, uh, I would also like to thank Indian Association of Structural and Engineers uh, to arrange this kind of a uh, uh, lecture uh, panel discussion. So thank you, sir, for uh, inviting us in this uh, agenda of yours. Moving on, uh, the project management, uh, the role, the role which is crucial in any of our demolition projects. 
uh, a little bit about us. Uh, we are uh, we started in 2004, and then uh, in 2010 we started demolishing complete structures. And today we we serve uh, crushing, we serve structural shearing with equipments, robotic demolitions. We have diamond sawings, implosions, and then debris downsizing. Uh, why is this project management important in demolition projects? Uh, we generally envisage the scrap involved in the uh, overall project, and uh, that is generated out of the overall project, and that we discount against the cost of demolition. So if the demolition project is delayed for any reason, this rebate still has to go to the, the clients, but there, due to their various fluctuation in the prices of all the salvageable material. At the end of the day, if the project is not completed on time, the way it was envisaged at the beginning, uh, we can have super losses as a contractor, which is utterly out of our control. So always we try to see that we have immaculate planning in what we start doing, whether it's a six months project, if we try to uh, cover it up in what minimum period we can. So the fluctuation in prices of salvageable material is always discounted and we don't overdo or uh, we don't really get less of pricing because of the variation of this uh, fluctuation, variation of prices of the salvageable material. Next, uh, what are the common reasons for demolition? If we have to see uh, age structures, damage infrastructure like natural disasters, lack of maintenance, accidents, incidents, change in business models. Initially, it was planned for a commercial, then they changed to residential. Uh, re repurposing of land, rehabilitation of lands, dilapidated structures, illegal structures, change in government policies of um, further giving ROCs for CCs for more taller structures, more uh, FARs to give in, then the changes in, in design during construction phase, and finally the demand and supply in the uh, space which is to be sold, which is to be constructed and sold. This all can generate a, a reason for demolition, and that's where we enter into this uh, line of action. There are a few uncommon reasons for demolition. Uh, some unsafe buildings, some contraventions in the laws, especially environmental laws, some legal compliance is not followed, some unsafe buildings, structures not built to the code it was actually supposed to be, then change of ownership. We've seen this now becoming a very, uh, though we've mentioned it in uncommon, but we've seen that changes of hands from one builder or a developer to another developer, uh, there is a lot of uh, inquiries we are facing, we are com coming up with, where we have to demolish uh, tall, huge structures, mass structures, because the new owner does not want the same design, same patterns. So this is again uncommon, but now we see more and more of inquiries of this nature. Uh, unique demolition considerations in India. Uh, if you see... Uh, Usually a very large number of stakeholders are involved. Uh, now we specifically go towards a little bit towards our uh, project, uh, which we are discussing the Twin Towers. Uh, highly densely populated uh, environments, areas, the urban environments are there. Many techniques are still relatively new in India. I mean, today we are really struggling with getting more and more technologies in India because still developers, builders are still with that conventional, they're still in that conventional uh, method of demolishing by maybe puncturing the columns and allowing the structures to fall. So our last 10 years, we've been trying to improve uh, the knowledge by safe demolitions. And we've seen there's a lot of change in developers, builders, plants, where we are uh, growing. So that's that's where we are growing every, every year on year, we're growing almost by 18 to 20%. Purely because people have now started understanding the, uh, the purpose, the reason for safety during demolition. It's Previously, it was envisaged as a demolition was just how much money we will get. Today, now people have started understanding that it has to be safe demolition. That is not their core business. The core business is construction and then getting money out of that construction rather than expecting a few uh, pennies out of demolition. Then there are uh, very highly publicized events, demolition are highly publicized events if done by specific methods like implosions, which we've seen. 
contractors like us are always in public domain. We are in public eyes. There are lots of uh, violation of norms, which is now giving rise to demolition, unique demolitions like what we did for uh, Supertech. Coming on specifically to Supertech, uh, everyone knows there were major stakeholders uh, overall project right from main contractor like us to specialist subcontractors, engineers, authorities, court, police, traffic, residents, associations press, local press, international press, and then finally public at large. So there was a lot of people involved in the overall project. And this makes much more difficult for a company, a contractor like us to manage the project because we need to understand requirements from each and every stakeholder, make sure that we adhere to it, and then finally implement it on site. So this becomes the more the stakeholders in, in a, a project it's, it's more complicated uh, and time consuming at times to overall complete the project in time. Uh, I'll move on to the core things of uh, project management, wherein first thing which we understand is the risk management. Here for Supertech, we've already discussed lots of uh, those nine meters away, we had uh, two towers, then we had a natural gas pipeline, then the road in the front side, there was a lot of risk on our reputations because large implosions were not common till date uh, in India. So there was a lot of reputation of, uh, of course, us along with jet demolition at stake. Risk of vibrations with uh, which were uh, onto the surrounding buildings, which were already dilapidated. Then the mitigation of dust was another risk which we had to envisage prehand, which we envisaged it prehand. However, we were not able to. Uh, exactly uh, mitigate that risk, but with the support of uh, CBRI, CSIR, uh, we, we try to cover up some green lawns where we can mitigate that uh, risk of dust on green areas, uh, surrounding properties, uh, building structures, and then NOIDA authority, of course, helped us to overall clean up things at a faster rate and uh, make this uh, that small city, that space area, uh, regularized, normal for people to walk around. As I discussed, it's a very close proximity of nine meter away, the path which we removed. Uh, when I say come on to the scope management, typically all demolition projects are in form of a lump sum offers. This means that the quantify, the risk is for us is to quantify the exact amount of steel uh, at the beginning of the project. Many a times you've seen the drawings do not exactly match with exact what is there on site. There is lots of uh, variation uh, as seen in the drawing and at actuals what we physically see. However, this uh, this becomes for us a very challenging uh, proposition to exactly measure quantities, volumes. If there is small deviation, we, which we are not envisaging at the beginning or during the course of action, we can have lots of uh, recuperances for on those factors. Uh, we as a contractors have to now plan uh, meticulously for uh, whatever debris we generate, whether it goes to the recycling plant or it goes to right authorized dumping places where it is not dumped on uh, roads and we don't uh, dilapidate or we don't uh, reduce our mother earth by removing uh, gravels from these uh, hills what we have. So this is again one more responsibility which uh, a contractor like us has uh, to take it further that we make sure the debris are going to the right places. This is what we were talking about the rubbles which we generated had to go to the right places time. This becomes a huge, huge uh, uh, aspect in our any contracts which we take for a, a complete management of a project. Time management becomes a major component. Like we were given three months by the highest court. However, when we uh, these kinds of complex projects, when you start preparing, you understand few things after you start preparing. And then uh, we, we see that we require much more time than what was envisaged at the beginning. Like after the test blast, we saw we, we changed many things like we saw in the previous slides. There was lots of layers were added, lots of uh, geotextile uh, 
chain links were added, lots of safety covers were added. We had to improve on the quantum of explosives. So all these things were added to give more time to the same project, which was initially envisaged for three months, but then finally we, we requested for an additional three months. Now this calculation of the additional three months was never envisaged by us. But then once if we have taken a project, we have to make sure that we complete it and to the best of our ability, that times, specifically I will tell in Supertech as a contractor, us along with jet demolition, we never saw anything on the commercial fronts. It was just one, one common agenda within the two of us that this building, the structures should come down safely and in the pre-planned manner, which we have envisaged. So, uh, it, this, 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 as for, therefore, this requires a lot of monitoring, a continuous monitoring and the progress and how we adopt <coughs> to those extra three months, how we manage our finances also and the time. Uh, is very critical as a contractor to us. This is the judgment where we were told to be done in three months' time. However, we went to the court with support from CBRI, uh, requesting for additional three months, and with support from uh, CSI or CBRI, we, we got that extension for three months. Cost management, uh, again, this demolition prices are generally fixed, and if it's a long-term contract, it is really difficult because there are so many factors which can increase or shoot up the cost in any 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 direction. Like there can be an improvement in labor costs, there can be an improvement in the cost of steel, uh, like wire mesh. I mean, we would have had almost, I would say, 20 kilometers of wire mesh deployed at Supertech. Now, if the steel prices at day, day one we envisaged was 30 rupees, and if it goes to 40 rupees, this gives a lot of impact on the cost of the project. We need to, the, the only challenge for us is, yes, this is our business, but we have to envisage this cost right at the beginning. So, uh, and we have to carry it further till we complete the project. So when we say management of projects are important, the demolition projects are important, it is critically important for us if we don't manage the project well in all the terms, in terms of risk, in terms of time, in terms of cost, in terms of stakeholders uh, understanding, we can utterly go into total terms. And we have very few uh, opportunities where we can correct our mistakes, which we, which we have done on day one, which we have very few uh, reasons where we can, or opportunities where we can correct it and go back to zero zeros. Change management is one more arena where uh, as a project uh, management, overall project management impacts uh, things like, like there's a strike, all of a sudden there are strikes and we, we have to be closed for next three days, four days. So uh, we, we, we cannot ask labors to be there without salaries. All those things add up to our cost. Like there was a grab uh, notification, like in Delhi, specifically in Noida, Delhi, NCRs. There is uh, environmental uh, uh, restrictions in the month of October, November. So when this grab comes into play, they don't allow any demolition to take in uh, take uh, uh, in process. So we had to stop almost for one and a half months to two months. Of course, that was after the blast, but we had to stop the work because it was notified that no demolition or construction activities can carry forward for next two months. So we we had our equipments in place, we had our manpower in place, and everything had to be halted for a period of two months. So these costs are uh, very critical, which impacts the this change management. When I say all of a sudden there is some some strike, all of a sudden there is some uh, uh, environmental issue, where lots of rains where we cannot work. So these constitute overall to the cost of our project. Hence, again, I'll come back saying that managing the project becomes really critical in any of a demolition project. Last thing I have to say is communication. On large projects, communicating with all stakeholders involved because every stakeholder will have their own uh, un uh, uh, level of understanding. They'll have their own queries. They'll have their own issues to be sorted out. No, no issues we've seen from the stakeholders, what you see in Supertech. They will all be uncommon to each other. I mean, police will have their own issues. Authorities will have their own issues. 
public at large will have their own issues. So these issues have to be sorted out before we really kick the final uh, button. However, uh, whenever we, we get this chance to do, uh, we keep on informing by means of flyers, by means of talking, by means of meetings. Uh, but then still, this, this communication management becomes a very critical role. If we don't communicate to people involved, we, we, we can have serious impact on the overall project. So basically, when we say we have to communicate, we have to communicate, we have to communicate. So uh, project management framework, if I have to say, is all four project phases must be considered and managed well. When I say managed well, is planning at the beginning before we start on-site, execution on-site for the six months. We are almost at three months, two and a half months of planning, then execution for six months, then monitoring and controlling during those period of nine months, and then finally the closeout, which we recently completed the overall project. So these all projects, all phases are very critical in project management, which will overall give profitability to a company or to a contractor like us who are doing these projects at our own bills. So if you fail to plan, we fail to you plan to fail. That's what I can say at the end. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Utkarsji, and uh, you you could uh, contribute to to the meticulous planning of the project and how the project management or project planning is important for uh, such type of uh, huge uh, demolition of huge stretch structures and that to to be a, in a perfect manner and with a safe demolition. So so now I I I. Uh, uh, Make you a pardon that uh, though uh, Joe Brickman uh, was planned to speak, but he is uh, just traveling to Australia. We got the news, so he, he uh, made an arrangement that uh, Miss Kate uh, Bester, on behalf of uh, Jet Demolition South Africa, will make the presentation. Thank you and welcome. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Yeah, it's visible and audible. You can go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Could you please confirm for me if you are able to see my screen? Yes, yes. It's visible. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kate Bessert. I'm a project manager and an engineer working for Jet Demolition in South Africa. Um, today, I think we've spoken a lot about the Supertech Towers, which is an incredibly difficult and challenging project. Um, I'd like to actually zoom back a little bit and give you a broader understanding of preparation work and considerations when planning large implosions and explosive demolition projects. Um, today, I'd like to have a look at different demolition methods that are available to demolition contractors, then move on to the application of explosives in demolition activities. We can look at the extensive preparation of structures for explosive demolition and implosion projects. And then I'd like to run through a few case studies and um, to show you the different ways of um, tackling explosive demolition projects. Um, I'm going to be try I'm going to try and be sensitive to time. So I'm going to go through quite quickly. We've got a lot of interesting visuals to share with you. If we had to consider demolition methods which are commonly available to industry, um, I think it's safe to assume that most structures are demolished mechanically, and this will be done either top down using basic hand tools, top down using powered hand tools and small machines. We can do top down demolition with high reach excavators, direct demolition with standard excavators, or diamond cut and lift off sections. A very small percentage of structures are actually demolished with explosives. Um, for very large, challenging structures, explosive demolition is the supremely superior method. And this assists us in terms of safety, in terms of time, cost, and practicality. Why are explosives so useful? Um, if you consider that explosives offer very rapid energy release, um, a rapid energy release obviously means extreme power. If you consider that all the power stations in India combined have a capacity of 418 gigawatts, um, a single 165 millimeter diameter explosive charge Delivers, delivers energy of 577 gigawatts um, instantaneous energy release. 
So you can see that explosives are extremely powerful and, and extremely useful. The main applications are in the mining industry to break rock, military industry to create weapons, and the construction industry again to break rock, and then obviously in demolition of large structures and buildings. There are different methods of applying explosives. Um, you can either place, con place the explosives within holes that are pre-drilled into concrete structures, or you can place these explosives onto the surfaces of steel or concrete. Um, if you're placing them onto the surfaces, you could use uh, shaped explosive charges. These charges form a high energy velocity jet that basically cuts the steel and breaks concrete. Um, just an interesting fact, if you have a look at our logo, the Jet Demolition logo, um, on the left-hand side, that's a depiction of um, one of our shaped explosive charges. And then as the charge actually shoots through the steel, that has created our logo for the last 30 years. I'd like us to have a look at different types of explosive-induced collapse. Um, we tend to look at a building superficially and assume that all the collapse mechanisms are the same. Um, the reality, though, is that there are a bunch of different mechanisms that we can apply um, depending on the site situation. So if we have a look at the one that I've depicted on screen, that would reflect a true vertical drop and crash. And this is an extremely rare method um, as it offers the highest resistance to collapse. What we're trying to do or illustrate here is that the floors will basically pancake on top of each other, resulting in a very high rubble stockpile. If we have a look at the second type of um, explosive induced collapse, we could do a rigid topple where the spine of the structure, so the entire building remains intact. You're basically severing the front section and having the whole thing topple as a unit. You could do a tilt and crush, which is where you're expecting the front face or the prepared face of the building to actually tilt down and then crush down to ground. Most commonly though, we would apply the sweeping waterfall a sweeping waterfall is useful because we can adjust the sweep speeds, the sweep angles, and we can actually initiate a pull and twist motion. Um, in a later case study, I will actually show you the um, implosion of the Bank of Lisbon building, where we successfully used the sweeping waterfall to manipulate a building as it came down so that we could actually fit it within its own basement footprint. Um, another way is obviously the frontal drop and rear topple where the rear of the building remains rigid and the front panels will actually drop down to ground. So you'll collapse the front section, the rear rigid panel will actually come down and just collapse to ground. Then we can also do a central drop and pull in ends. Um, on one of the videos that was shown earlier, we could actually see this very clearly demonstrated where you um, place your explosive charges and you determine your timing you strengthen your floors and you stabilize your structure. So you're basically creating a central drop in the middle of the building and you're pulling the wings of the building in on top of itself. Considerations um, of explosive induced collapse design. Um, of critical importance would obviously be to have not just a, a working knowledge, but um, a significant knowledge of both explosives and structural engineering. Um, that partnered with extensive experience is the only way to really tackle these demanding projects. Um, you need to be able to craft the design to actually suit your situation. Um, that could mean to choose the correct collapse mechanism to ensure that the structure actually falls where you need it to fall, but more importantly also to manage the rubble stockpile and the debris stockpile after the fact. And there are no formal design guidelines which can be applied to all implosion scenarios. And as you'll see through the case studies a little later, um, just about every implosion of every building is different and um, with different priorities and different mechanisms, different site conditions. Accordingly, the design needs to be different and unique as well. Computer modeling is still at an early stage. It's an incredibly useful tool, um, but we do caution clients, we do caution um, the parties that we work with, um, that implosions are non-linear process with many moving parts. There are infinite discrete elements and connections, which are incredibly difficult to simulate and model um, accurately. Um, it's a highly empirical tool. It's a sales tool. It's dynamic. It's colorful. It's interesting. Um, it's exciting. But without the experience to back up the tool, it just remains a tool. 
So we always need to be cautious to ensure that we combine extensive experience with these tools to actually get the best benefit. And we also just want to make a note that it's very difficult to predict the two be true behavior of the debris spread, um, especially on restricted sites using computer modeling. And um, we hope to see huge advances in um, the computer modeling sphere going forward, um, but it is still in its infancy stage. If we have a look at the design considerations and structural preparation, um, there are different facets of every building or every implosion or every explosive demolition project that needs to be considered very carefully. Um, as illustrated earlier in one of the earlier presentations, there's extensive pre-weakening and partial removal that has to happen. This will include the columns, the beams, the walls, shear walls, load-bearing elements. Um, we have to weaken the structure in order to get the desired results during implosion. We need to consider explosives placement and the initiation sequences. This would mean either drilling of the holes in concrete or pre-cutting on steel sections to accept the shape charges. We need to consider the number, location, size, initiation sequence and timing of each of these charges to get the desired collapse result. Um, we need to do detailed structural engineering. Uh, we need to consider that live loads have been removed. Dead loads need to be removed and that's brick and block walls, internal walls, serviceability requirements are removed. We need to ensure that we can maintain the structural stability to keep our people within the building safe, but also to weaken the structure sufficiently that it reacts accordingly. Um, it's very important to obviously execute structural analysis of all preparations being planned. The most challenging structures to prepare for explosive or implosion demolition um, would be structures in high seismic hazard zones, uh, these structures are typically built very strong and they're very resistant to progressive collapse. Um, are the other items or other buildings that are also incredibly difficult are fire damaged buildings to manage. Um, sorry, I see there are a few hands raised. No? Yeah, you can, you can, you can go ahead for- Continue? For maybe, yeah. Thank you. Um, if we have a look at the design damage, um, we need to decide how much damage we want to inflict onto the structure. So either we need to decide whether we want to remove the strength entirely, whether we want to weaken structure and structural elements for gradual failure, or whether we want to induce hinging action of different elements. More often than not, we will do um, all three of these items in different portions of the building on different structural elements. So you'll have a combination of entire strength removal in some elements, weakening for separate elements, and then hinging of the third type of element. We need to consider debris fly protection. So at source fly arrest, um, as Mr. Mehta had earlier indicated, we need to consider um, installation of mechanical sort of protection measures to ensure that we can maintain the fly within the structure. This includes using items such as woven steel wire fence, geotextile fabric, sandbags, wooden sheeting panels and boxes, rubber and plastic mats. Perimeter protection, we would commonly use um, woven steel wire fence combined with geotextile fabric. And then obviously we need to consider the surrounding structures as well. Um, so as seen in many of the photos that have flashed up on screen today, we do use geotextile fabric extensively, but we can also use wooden sheeting and in some cases steel shipping containers to ensure that um, any rubble fly is contained within the footprint of the site. We need to consider the ground vibration from collapse. Um, there is insufficient uh, data available for us to really comprehensively determine what the ground vibration would be. Um, this is a non-instantaneous impact. There's a stream of particles over a course of several seconds. Um, we can install mitigation measures such as input cushion berms and trenches and we can also select crush floors within the building and um, floors which are designed to actually crush on top of each other and soften the blow basically and um, that's transferred to ground. We need to consider air blast. Um, air blast is obviously a huge risk to windows, ceilings, large light fittings etc. Um, we need to consider that damage potential is controlled by impulse which is a function of pressures over time. Um, high pressure and short time, 
doesn't result in damage. Low pressure and long time doesn't uh, result in damage. So we need to ensure that if we are targeting larger targets, we need to fail at lower impulse levels. I'd like to run through a few case studies very quickly. Um, as you can see on screen, My apologies. Okay, so we've had a look extensively at the Neudertin Towers um, through different um, presentations by colleagues on the call today. I'm not going to go into any great detail with Twin Towers. I think we are familiar with them. Um, I think it's just interesting to note that there was 750,000 square feet of total built up area that needed to be managed. And we did use over a million square meters of chain link fencing and 2 million square meters of geotextile. Um, to offer protection here. This is just a, um, a screenshot showing the structures coming down. And then obviously this is the result of all that upfront planning and preparation and um, where you can see the structure neatly within the footprint as had been designed. If we have a look at a separate project, um, which was done for Tata Steel in Jamshedpur, again with our partners, Edifice Engineering, we um, were employed to um, explosively collapse a coal tower and two chimneys. Um, these chimneys are within an operational uh, facility. It would have been absolutely critical to ensure a predictable collapse. Um, the majority of our blast preparations on the chimneys were done um, on the lower five meter section of each chimney. We installed mechanical hinges within the concrete structure that could actually ensure a deviation from line of fall. Um, we installed a catch pit um, two and a half meters deep to accept the chimneys as they actually came down to ground. Um, upon advice from experts, we also installed a rain curtain to assist with the um, dust debris that was generated after the filling of the chimneys. We installed a catch net inside each of these chimneys. Uh, the catch net was critical to ensure the safety of persons that we could actually enter into the bottom of the chimneys while we were preparing and installing hinges. The coal tower on screen had an um, external staircase and the staircase we needed to tie to the remaining structure so that when the structure was filled, the staircase would actually come down to ground with the rest of the structure predictably. Um, the largest okay. portion of the mass of the structure Skid. was, Skid. yes sir? A couple of minutes more. Huh? Okay. I, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, we're sitting atop 18 meter tall columns. Tall slender columns are incredibly difficult to um, get right, especially with explosive demolition methods. However, we did get them down safely. So this is just a good view showing the coal tower and both chimneys that needed to be collapsed. And then if we have a look here, this is the prepared catch pit for the first chimney that came down. Again, we, we applied the trenches and the booms. We applied um, shipping containers. We applied the geotextile fabric around the perimeter and guided the chimney into the catch, catch pit using the mechanical hinge system that we had installed. This is just a view along the chimney. In the bottom right-hand side of the screen, you can actually see the remainder of the um, mechanical hinge system. This is the Bank of Lisbon building that I had alluded to earlier. Um, in summary, the Bank of Lisbon building had suffered a devastating fire across four floors. The structure was severely compromised, it was condemned and it needed to be imploded urgently. We installed gun poles and we installed uh, measuring devices to monitor any movement of the structure um, during demolition activities ensuring that our people could stay safe. This is a twist and pull collapse. So as you see, the Bank of Lisbon building wasn't central to the site footprint. So we had to pull the building somewhat into the site and also twist it as it came down to ensure that the rubble and debris stockpile could actually fit within the prepared basements. This is an aerial view um, within 10 minutes after the implosion before we were allowed to inspect the site. And where we could just clearly see the perimeter of the basement, the close proximity of the adjacent building, and all the demolition rubble within the footprint. Different applications of um, explosive demolition methods, and this is a steel gas holder that had suffered a devastating fire. We actually um, did pre-cutting of the structural elements on the structure. We um, 
affixed shape charge explosives to it, and we blasted the structure in the immediate proximity of live services, so this electrical pylon and the gas lines around the edges, um, and the implosion was designed to ensure no damage to any of this infrastructure. This is the the Corex iron making unit, the challenge on this project was that it was a composite structure. You are not audible. Hmm. So I lost connectivity, but I also reached the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Very nice presentation from your side. And uh, we are uh, the last presentation by uh, Mr. Mickey Mekan Dalvera. He is a senior scientist in uh, Central Building Research Institute, Rurki. And he will talk about sustainability and carbon from footprint for demolition of structures. Mickey, please. Sir. Uh, sir, is my screen visible? Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Thank yes, you. visible, visible. Ah, a very good afternoon to all in one present. Uh, so, uh, as uh, very rightly. Uh, has been uh, discussed by uh, my previous uh, uh, speakers about the structural, geotechnical, the instrumentation and other aspects of the very challenging uh, project that uh, was successfully carried out. So in this particular uh, um, session, a quick session, I'll say I was, um, I, I'll be uh, talking briefly touching upon the sustainability and carbon footprint issues that uh, were uh, related to this particular uh, uh, project. So uh, basically, uh, I, I do not have a core competency in, uh, in, in, in discussing this whole thing. So I'm a structural member, still I'll try to highlight uh, the issues that, uh, that were taken as a measure. So these are some of the four uh, measures that were taken as a uh, way to uh, reduce the uh, air pollution and uh, make, a, make the demolition in a more, um, uh, sustainable way. Uh, these were basically covering of buildings in geotextile fabric. Uh, basically, as you can see uh, in the um, front picture where uh, the buildings were wrapped in geotextile fabric, which uh, where uh, the main intention was to uh, prevent the uh, flying debris from hitting the nearby buildings, as well as to, uh, it's not possible to uh, uh, mitigate the fine dust particles, but to yeah, to some extent to cut and and uh, from the uh, figure it can be seen that to some extent as well as from physical e examination, it was to some extent it it uh, achieved its uh, purpose. Then barricading of the periphery of the debris pile, sprinkling of water in the surrounding area to uh, reduce the uh, dust that was uh, generated. Uh, and uh, washing of the areas to remove, uh, to uh, re avoid any health hazard to the uh, occupants that were supposed to come in the next day uh, after the demolition. Then the processing of CND waste has uh, been uh, uh, discussed by, uh, shared by my previous speakers. There was around 80,000 uh, tons of uh, CND waste that was generated. And out of that, uh, around 50,000 tons were used as the basement uh, filling, uh, in filling of the um, uh, this is the um, present day pick of the uh, place where it has been now uh, made a um, uh, um, flat ground and around 50,000 tons of CND waste uh, that, were, that has been used in covering the area and uh, uh, 30,000 tons that was uh, transported were uh, rightfully developed uh, uh, into some value added products like uh, tiles, bricks and uh, it was used. So uh, other aspect of the 
is the carbon footprint. Basically, carbon footprint is the amount of greenhouse gases that is produced directly or indirectly as a result of building demolitions in uh, uh, Eastern, in in the European and uh, uh, countries. There is a set uh, um, guidelines to calculate uh, the carbon footprint of each and every activities. But uh, and uh, from there, uh, literature has been uh, that I'm uh, presenting basically. Uh, the carbon footprint calculation for building demolition is in a developing process, and uh, the reason being, it is not being seen as a you know uh, as a process where the party which does the carbon footprint analysis gets any carbon credit. So, uh, but gradually over the years, uh, last uh, five to six years, it has been a trend, and people are coming out. And in that that aspects. Uh, generally, these six operations are generally taken into consideration. Basically, the movement of staffs and equipment to and from the sites, operation of the site accommodation, operations of demolition, plant and machinery. A again, this when I say about building demolition, it uh, encompasses the activities previously carried out during the demolition as well as the post-demolition uh, things. Then processing of the waste material and movement of waste material off-site then the type of reuse of waste material on what context uh, the waste materials are being used in this particular uh, point i would like to say there uh, there may there uh, has been uh, uh, observation in the literature it says that there are places where the um, waste materials need to be um, uh, need, needs to be processed uh, for uh, hazardous things for its accommodate uh, for its reuse. So in that case, the uh, uh, it uh, the um, uh, the reusability uh, of this uh, carb uh, is uh, is reduced, and they don't get any carbon credit for that. Then again, if we can uh, sum up the scopes of the scope of demolition uh, emissions, it can uh, in a very uh, nutshell, it can be uh, you know systematically if we can. Uh, phase out. Uh, so this is the flow chart that can be used. Uh, it can rightly uh, be uh, observed that from right from pre-construction phase to demolition phase, the CO2 emission li uh, lies of the responsibility to the responsible party. Uh, it has to be, it, 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 it needs to be uh, uh, categorized. And from this uh, chart, the um, um, it can be seen the demolition company as well as the, uh, the various aspects, right from design, to the operation of demolition plant machinery, everything needs to be categorized. Now, list of the material, the, here is the list of material, which uh, after uh, carrying out this analysis, the list of material and the systematic way, where uh, and uh, uh, the, the way, the method of uh, 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 disposal and the reason, it should be uh, carried out and more, of, more or less this uh, process has been adopted for this particular uh, twin tower demolition case. And uh, with that, this uh, brief thing, I conclude and uh, over to sir. Hello. Yeah, uh, Mickey, just uh, on share, you stop sharing. Yeah. Sir. So, uh, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I just make an excuse that that uh, we are uh, over my time 14 minutes uh, so I'm uh, really uh, sorry for that for all the participants and uh, this thing so, and over to over to the president I struck T, I struck T and uh, uh, director CSR CBRI. For, yeah. For uh, Kanumaji, yeah thank you so much a really uh, wonderful uh, uh, lectures by everyone. And uh, we have got a very good response in the form of questions. So I uh, request uh, uh, Kanumaji to coordinate this, uh, answering this question. Some of the questions you can take it up now and uh, some we can reserve it to our panel discussion. Okay, so uh, you can uh, uh, start with that. You, you can click the question answer and then uh, see. Uh, there is a question from uh, Mr. Susil Dhawan. What type of explosion used and what was the cost of demolition? So the first part, uh, I think uh, Dr. Harsh Burma will take up what type of explosion uh, was used. 
explosives and uh, the cost part i think uh, mr utkars mesa will answer yeah so am i audible now dr kanundu yes yes okay so thank you for the question see as far as the explosive is concerned uh, the first type of explosive is basically small diameter cartridge explosive all the explosive material that has been used they are all indigenously produced in india uh, they are all supplied by solar explosive group and uh, it's the strength is 90 90% strength uh, so that's the explosive but the major portion of the explosive that's basically a detonating fuses uh, which is having a slightly varying range of uh, petn around 80 gram per meter to around 10 gram per meters for connections within the hole it was actually 80 gram per meter whereas for the connection or different holes for the circuitry arrangement it was 10 gram per meter Apart from that, the uh, initiating devices like non-electric ignition system, which is called shock tube initiation system, they were used. Uh, that is also two to, to different types. One is called short delay detonators, having a delay time of around 25 milliseconds between successive series. And then we have got a long delay series, which is called 500 milliseconds of uh, time interval between two different series. Then apart from this, electrical detonators were also used for the final firing. So these are all, all about the explosives. Regarding the cost, I will uh, request Mehta Sahib to please comment on that. Yeah, I mean, in, in short, if I have to explain the cost, the overall project cost uh, to the developer was close to 18 crores. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, then uh, I think there are some more questions from SK Dhawan Sahib. And the uh, waterfall effect we have explained in two, three uh, presentations. So the debris management also and uh, NOIDA authority helped us. They have a uh, <clears throat> plant, uh, CND waste um, disposal plant and uh, the, uh, we, we carried out every debris what was above the surface. I, I told 50,000 tons of debris has been uh, managed in, in fulfilling the both the basements in both the towers. And then 30,000 around has been uh, uh, um, uh, transported to, to the plant and uh, they, they are being recycled and uh, uh, reused in again uh, for, for further construction. And the major challenges for ensuring safety, if I look into that, it was the 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 structural integrity, the condition of the Ikorba towers. There are five towers which was in the near vicinity of this demolition site and the structural health of those five towers was a major challenge. And we have to have a major pre-demolition structural assessment, structural analysis and identifying those structural elements and strengthening those structural elements to ensure that it will <coughs> sustain the, the uh, expected ground vibration. So that was a major challenge, but, but all the five towers, we identified the, the elements scientifically or, or from through engineering tools. And uh, we rest assured that the super tech and and um, uh, with with the satisfaction of the residents that the the structural strengthening what we suggested or plan it is uh, executed on time before demolition and 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 then only we allowed for for uh, uh, demolition so it was a tough task uh, for 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 um, ensuring that then uh, i will take uh, some four, uh, one question from uh, Mukun Jail, was foundation removed completely? No, the raft was, it was, it was gone up to the basement, two basements. And then finally we, we removed uh, also the raft portion of that because, because it was in the, in the agreement, it was already um, uh, executed very meticulously what is to be removed completely. So up till the, the base raft, we, we removed and then the debris is filled up and now there is a beautiful um, ground and with greeneries and a, a beautiful park is coming up in that place. Mm, yeah, uh, yes, we agree that insufficient time has been given for each presentation. 
but if it will plan it for too lengthy then then um, then there will be a problem to to contain all the participants because all are busy people and technical people uh, uh, was the demolition insured and who was the insurer yes there was a insurance against this demolition i think uh, mr utkars yes. can uh, tell uh, about insurance yeah it was uh, we've taken collateral damage insurance against collateral damage due to the fall due to implosion basically for any collateral damage it was 100 crores and for uh, specifically for the gas pipeline it was a, a separate 5 crores insurance which was taken so overall all together it was 105 crores for the project and it was done by tata aig there was no precedence of this kind of an insurance so uh, we were talking with various companies, but uh, it was Tata who rose his hands and this was a maximum which they, they permitted to give. We actually expected, uh, we ex actually asked them for an uh, insurance of 300 crores. Uh, but then, however, this was the limitation which they had from their end. So the maximum which was given was 105 crores. Yeah. Then another question, did the building owner pay the demolition cost? Yes, Supertech uh, bears all the cost of demolition and the whole process. And how much time was taken to plan demolition? Actually, uh, Mr. Utkar Smith has already uh, told it was in August 2021, uh, the Honorable Supreme Court has, has um, uh, predicted that it will be, uh, will be going for demolition and in August 22. So the whole time is one year, but effectively three months for Correct. preparation and then um, uh, another nine months out of nine months effectively six months we took and because of environmental reasons removal of debris and all those things it was delayed another additional uh, two and three months so that's the total uh, time taken for uh, uh, this how the structural stability of adjacent structures assessed after demolition Yes, uh, we, we had a precondition that there will be pre-demolition structural assessment and post-demolition structural assessment. And we closed the project from technical side once we received the post-demolition uh, structural stability assessment and we planned and we worked with uh, jet demolition and, and edifice engineering that the structural stability assessment or whatever NDT or ground inspection or investigation to be done by the supertech and the finite element analysis by 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 edifice engineering and and in collaboration with CBRI and we rest assured pre demolition structural assessment improve the structural stability of the structure surrounding structures and then. In the post demolition stage, also we ensured that it, the integrity is maintained so that we allowed the, 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 the residents to come back to their residence, and, and, and that was done. Uh, one question for uh, Dr. Harsh Parma vibration was found higher in the middle or uh, top floors when compared to basement. Could you please explain a bit more of it? Yes, sir. So it's a very good question, actually. You know, <clears throat> but you can understand, actually, it's a little bit degree of freedom. <clears throat> Immediately, tower or some uh, rigid body or whatever it is, say, disconnected at the ground level. Now, whatever vibration loading that happens, actually, the vibration will be lesser at the foundation level. But as the degree of freedom is more at the top level, definitely the displacement will be more, velocity will be more. So that is the reason, actually. So that is why if you see the value at the foundation level is lower and as we go up, the, there is a increase in the value of a particular city that is observed. So that, that is the reason. I think it is clear to you. And the last question by Srinivasa Charilu, it is, is there code available on demolition in India? No. Yeah, yeah there is a draft code. It is yeah. a circulation. Uh, uh, there is a draft code in circulation and it is going to be coming up in, in uh, maybe a few months. But, uh, explain but, uh, mostly but mechanical uh, there different. are uh, uh, codes available for, for this sort of blasting and all these things on uh, what should be. I think Dr. Harsh Barma has shared that slide 
on on indian courts uh, what is available what is on uh, peak particle velocity allowable limit and also air over pressure allowable limit at different distances from the uh, site of uh, uh, demolition or or uh, when we are using explosives yeah that's there <coughs> thank you very much sir uh, i think we have covered almost all the questions yeah. thank you uh, thank you everyone one and all thank you so much for the really wonderful uh, session uh, i think we have uh, we will definitely get more questions during our panel discussion which is at 3:30 uh, now i'll uh, pass it on to uh, uh, shri manoj mittal ji for closing this session yeah so yeah, thank you it was very uh, great presentations and all the speakers uh, made really very nice presentations and they covered all aspects related to the demolition of these uh, towers including the structural part geotechnical vibration management sustainability explosives i think all the parts uh, uh, have already been covered and i think now participant must be aware how this kind of a demolition was planned and executed so precisely so thank you uh, all of uh, presenters uh, who made the presentation it was very uh, knowledgeable and very informative session and i think in the next session we will have a panel discussion uh, and all the speakers will be there in the panel discussions also most of them will be available there so if 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 participants have more questions they can uh, they can write to us they can email to us to the iest email id or whatever and we will take more questions uh, during that uh, yeah. panel discussion part thank you so much thank you yeah thank you thank, thank you. you very much thank you thank you very much sir it was a pleasure uh, meeting again all the mates actually we have a very good time uh, during this entire exercise and it was a very very coordinated effort uh, shared by dr karungo and uh, it's again the pleasure talking about all the issues that we have done in that little Uh, say around six seven months back. I think, I think we celebrated the anniversary of safe demolition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Almost. Thank you very much uh, for uh, <laughs> IS Bhakti for giving us the opportunity to share our uh, experiences uh, with uh, the 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 experienced community of of uh, of uh, our nation. Thank you. Yeah, very thank much. you so.